Well, it should be a comfort that there's people smarter than the people that don't think that we're doing it. That there are people that can possibly consider some sort of way to mitigate this. Yeah. And what what are the what are the ways that are being proposed, and how seriously are they being taken? Other than this, um, the idea of building these machines to extract carbon yeah. from the atmosphere. I'm sure you're probably aware of. Um, there's some of the programs that they've talked about uh, we're suspending reflective particles in the atmosphere yeah. to to minimize the amount of solar radiation we receive. Yeah, so it's interesting, this guy who I mentioned earlier, who's like done the most, the sort of most innovative carbon capture machine. I talked to him a few weeks ago and he was like, no, 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 but we shouldn't be using carbon <laughs> capture. We should be doing solar geoengineering, which is what you're talking about. Um, and that means probably suspending sulfur is like the most useful thing in the <laughs> atmosphere. Um, oh, great, we're gonna smell like sulfur. Well, the, sun, the sky would get red. Oh, Jesus. There are all of these aesthetic effects too, which nobody talks about. So like trees are gonna just turn immediately brown. They're oh, not gonna turn color. <laughs> there, there was a study a couple weeks ago that the oceans are gonna change color. Um, there, this is if we do that, if we suspend No, 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 this is just period. from warming, just from warming. The ocean's gonna change color to what yeah i think just from more green to more blue but um, that'd be nice yeah <laughs> um but yeah so the the sulfur thing is um I, so we could you know we could suspend these um basically an umbrella of sulfur around um in the atmosphere which would mean that it would some of the sunlight coming to the earth would be reflected back into the atmosphere and that would mean that the sun would absorb less sunlight i mean the earth would absorb less sun sunlight which would make it a little bit cooler um the problem is that would have some crippling impacts on agriculture. And we basically don't know other side effects that it would have. And how would you take that stuff out? Well, you could just stop doing it. It has a shelf life of, I don't know what it is, 10 years. So you could just stop doing it. And that's a big concern, actually, because if we did that just to mask the amount of global warming that we were doing, then whatever program was responsible for it would be really vulnerable to terrorism, um, to war, because if we if we were if the planet were functionally warmed say five degrees but we were suspending enough sulfur that it was actually only two degrees warmer then if we just for instance like somebody bombed the facility that was doing it the planet would be immediately tripped into a much much hotter state and that would be completely catastrophic even more catastrophic than a more slow approach to five degrees because we would adjust to it we over in a century or several centuries we might yeah. in ways we'd be able to adjust to it so but it, if it was it immediate would be Im immediate yeah now, wh why sulfur i think it's just something about the particular characteristic of it i don't know wouldn't it smell hard i mean it would literally be like hell like that's what you yeah you always hear about with horror movies right the devil smells like sulfur yeah and I mean, it's the um, it's what farts smell like. Yeah. And the reason that we well, the reason we're able to smell farts is because sulfur is um, <coughs> also I mean some related uh, compounds, hydrogen sulfide, are um, are really toxic. And well, so that yeah. brings me to methane. That's another issue as well, right? Yeah. If the cows producing methane gas. Yeah. A, a large scale agricultural. Yeah. Wait. Let me just say one more thing about sure, the, um, um, the solar geoengineering. So the thing about that that's real. This sounds horrifying. This program. People are excited about it because it's really cheap. It's way cheaper than carbon capture. And um, but so there's a positive for it. But it's also um, we are basically already doing this. So we have what's called small particulate pollution. Um, that's or aerosol pollution. Um, stuff suspended in the, in the atmosphere. That's why like Delhi is really hard to breathe in because we have a lot of particulate in the atmosphere. That is already suppressing global temperatures by as much as a half degree or maybe one degree, which means, and that's the reason that those 9 million people are dying every year from air pollution. So if we solve that problem, if we solve the air pollution problem, save those 9 million lives we, every year, we would immediately make the planet at least a half a degree warmer and possibly one degree warmer, which would put us at the threshold of catastrophe or above it. Um, so we're sort of already doing this program, just not in a systematic way. We're doing it in a haphazard way. Um, the methane that you mentioned, there are basically two big issues with methane. The first is um, cows. Um, so yeah, cows produce a ton of methane, which is, depending on how you count, about 35 or maybe 85 times stronger a greenhouse gas than carbon. Whoa. Yeah, it's really intense. Um, but there are also these like small scale studies that show if we feed cattle just a little bit of seaweed, their methane emissions could fall by 95 or 99%. So we could, if, if that was scalable, which is not clear it is, but if it was, we could immediately eliminate the entire carbon footprint of beef, which people talk about a lot now. That's incredible. 
Yeah, just it, it's a reminder to me that like, you know, you get told, oh, you should eat less hamburgers or whatever. But obviously this is like a problem that's too big to be solved with like individual choices. We need some kind of global policy or national policy about it. But the scarier methane issue is um, there's all this carbon stored in frozen permafrost in the mm -hmm. northern latitudes. Um, that permafrost is melting. And when it melts, that carbon will be released into the atmosphere. We don't know the proportion that it will be released as carbon dioxide versus methane. But um, there is in that permafrost twice as much carbon as now exists in the atmosphere, which means if it were all released, possibly in a relatively sudden way, it could make um, our carbon problem immediately three times worse. Um, and it could be even the effect could even be more dramatic than that if it was released mostly as methane because methane is a stronger greenhouse gas. Most scientists think that that's not something that we need to freak out about in the short term, but it's there, it is melting, and methane is being released at some rate. So. The craziest solution that I ever heard for that one <clears throat> was to uh, bring back the woolly mammoth. Yeah. Yeah. They're trying to do that. Yeah. And th the idea that the woolly mammoth is going to save us all by releasing them throughout Siberia. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? <laughs> I mean, I think that we're going to have a whole a century of shit like that and shit like cows eating seaweed that everything, you know, we'll have our global politics will be reoriented around climate change so that you'll start to see sanctions put against nations that are behaving badly. Um, MBS, the guy who's, you know, the like kind of thug who's running Saudi Arabia now says he needs Saudi Arabia's economy to be totally off oil by 2050. And I think that's because he knows that you know, the global community will not tolerate someone producing more oil yeah. and, um, as recently as, it, you know, as, as, as soon as a few decades from now. But the impacts are, you know, everywhere. So that like, um, yeah, like in California now, you can, you know, during wildfire season, you can buy um, masks to, you know, to shield yourself from the smoke, which is really, really damaging. Its effects on cognitive performance are really dramatic can lower cognitive performance by like 10 to 15%. Its effect on the development of kids is really dramatic. Um, there was an incredible study a few years ago where if you looked at places where they instituted easy, do you have easy pass out here in California? No, we don't We don't have uh, tolls. Oh, right. Isn't so, that amazing? Yeah. You guys just <laughs> think, the what, like the one or two places? Yeah, but like depending on where you lived, you'd have to take that every day. Dude, in New York, they're everywhere. I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, like the, okay. All right, yeah. So Not it used bridge. to be the case that cars had to like slow down and pay a toll. Yeah. And because they were slowing down, they produced more exhaust. When they instituted Easy Pass, cars could just drive through. Right. And that meant they produced less exhaust. And the effect on the on premature birth and low birth weight in the areas where they instituted these new Easy Pass toll plazas, it reduced them by like 15% each. That's oh. how dramatic just the exhaust effect is on development of babies um how much is an effect of electric cars yeah that can i mean that that will be right huge. now it hasn't had enough of an, an effect because there's not enough of them yeah um and but yeah i mean the that problem on the on like at the technological level has been solved we know how to replace cars with electric cars we can make them even pretty affordable not quite as affordable as they need to be but the new Teslas are like 35 grand, I think. If you get it down to 15 grand, that'll be, you know, that'll be a huge solution. But then there are a lot of other problems that are more difficult, like air travel. You yeah. can't, we don't have electric planes around the corner. You can't fly planes. Is um, there anything like that on the horizon? Is it? There's some people who are, tr who are trying to develop it, but it seems like probably it's at least like a decade away. And, you know, one cross-country flight in the U.S. is the equivalent, uh, one seat on one cross-country flight is the equivalent of eight months of driving. Every time you fly from New York what? to London and back, you melt nine, three square meters of ice. Every single seat on every flight from New York to London melts three square meters of ice, um, of Arctic what? ice. What? Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> That's real? Yeah. yeah eight, I think it's every, 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 every time you fly across the country, it's like eight months of driving? Yeah. Whoa. So globally, air travel is only 2% of the carbon footprint, so it's relatively small. But for people in, especially rich people in rich countries, it's a much bigger part of the footprint. Because they fly around all over yeah. the place. But yeah, no, the average American, I think the stat is the average American every year emits enough carbon to melt 10,000 tons of ice. Jesus Christ. That's just the average American. And if you're a person like me who flies like every other weekend, it's way worse, way worse. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> holy shit. 
<clears throat> you put it in that perspective, it's how much fucking ice is there? I mean, there's it's, a lot of ice. Yeah, but it's gonna melt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's I, how you get you know the out the outside projections, the high end projections for a sea level rise are 260 feet. Now, um, the the plus side is it's way better to get co- hotter than it is to get colder, right? Like ice ages kill everything. Well, the you know the each of the so there've been five mass extinctions in planetary history in Earth's history before. One of them was ki- was caused by an asteroid, but the other four were um, were produced by global warming related to greenhouse gas. Um, and one what of about them the ice age. Well, the ice age doesn't count. It didn't didn't kill as many. No, really. The the biggest ma- mass extinction, the End Permian extinction, um, which was two hundred fifty two million years ago, ninety to ninety five percent of all life on Earth died <laughs> when was that 252 million years ago god damn. so each of these mass extinctions basically is like a complete slate wiping of the evolutionary record it's like we're starting over from scratch so we want to think that the the asteroid that hit the yucatan did the most damage in terms of the fossil record is that not true is the one that was the the global warming was that more well so there there are five and four of them were from global warming and the worst the worst one was just from from greenhouse gas warming but yeah the the one that killed the dinosaurs was also really bad it was something like 70 percent of all life on it but it's Less than the one where there was a yeah. temperature rise. Yeah. Wow. There was a um, a volcano. Ex- this is a little bit sketchy science, but there was a volcano <laughs> explosion, um, something like thirty thousand years ago or something. I don't remember the exact dates, but that um, volcanoes can cool uh, global temperature for the same reason we're talking about with suspending mm-hmm. particles, because it basically clouds the atmosphere with, um, and it dropped global temperatures. I think it was two degrees, and the human population at the time then shrunk. To seven thousand, so there was this yeah, incredible we bottleneck. Yeah, we talked about that a bunch of times. That's yeah. less people than live on Nantucket. <laughs> and it just it just makes you see like everything about the way that we live on this planet is dependent on climate conditions. Yeah, like we'll figure a way to like have a civilization, but it will be transformed. It will be very different if the world is four degrees warmer. Yeah. Um, and you know everything about the way that we take for everything we take for granted today is like a permanent feature of the modern world, I think we're going to learn is much more precarious, much more unstable. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, you know, climates were stable for all of human history. That's how we were able to evolve. It's how we were able to invent agriculture. The part of the world where we did invent agriculture in the Middle East, it's now getting almost too hot to grow crops. It's also going to be too hot to go to Mecca for a pilgrimage in just a couple decades. Whether like we're entirely outside of that, um, window of temperatures, which means we're functionally now living on an entirely different planet than humans ever lived on before. And it's going to keep changing. So by the time we get to two, three, four degrees, we'll be living in in a climate that's, you know, two or three or four times as much different as the one that we're in now from the one before the industrial revolution. And yeah, it's like those impacts could be totally overwhelming and catastrophic. 